On behalf of Maggie's, uh, a warm welcome to everyone here. Um, if you signed up for the original session, thank you very much for coming back. I know we have rescheduled it. Um, and many of you will know about Maggie's as well um, and the work we do. Uh, we have many colleagues from our fantastic corporate partners here with us today. Um, I know we have representatives from so many different sectors. We have construction, um, healthcare, insurance, um, IT, the list goes on. Um, and uh, it's just great that we have so many people from our corporate partners here today. Uh, for those of you who are new to Maggie's and maybe have found out about us uh, through LinkedIn, um, we are a cancer charity and we have 25 years of providing free cancer support for people in our centres across the UK. Maggie's centres are based in the grounds of uh, cancer hospitals. Um, and they're run by expert staff um, who uh, kind of do sessions like this. So kind of sessions around um, things that maybe affect people with cancer. They um, facilitate workshops around different cancer types, nutrition, managing stress. We also have lots of different benefits advisors and cancer support specialists. And all of this is for free. Um, and there's no kind of um, requirement to register with us. You can find out about everything that we do on maggies.org. Um, and despite being a cancer charity, our cancer support specialists and center heads have a wide variety of um, expertise, um, including talking about menopause. Um, so we're very um, grateful for uh, two speakers joining us here today. Um, as we know, menopause is a very timely topic it's been a lot in the news recently. I um, mean, it can be also kind of taboo or sensitive or embarrassing to talk about maybe in a workplace context. Um, so we're really um, pleased to welcome Lisa Punt, who is center head for Maggie's Cambridge, um, and also Nicola Riley, who is health and wellbeing consultant at um, Unum. So Lisa was a consultant radiographer in gynecological oncology and she trains with the British Menopause Society. And Nicola is responsible for employee well-being at UNAM. She's designed and implemented workplace well-being strategies and programming within the NHS, GlaxoSmithKline, local authorities, and now for UNAM. Um, so before I hand over to Lisa, just to introduce what we'll be going through today, just some housekeeping rules. Um, you may have heard the robotic voice as you came in, um, just saying that um, we are recording this, so this will be available uh, for anyone to watch back, and this will be on our YouTube channel. Um, so if someone you know would like to join um, but hasn't managed to get here today, they will be able to view the session. Um, the second half of the session today um, will be kind of a discussion uh, between Lisa and Nicola, but also there'll be a chance to ask questions. Um, and you'll have a Q&A button on the bar, on the bottom bar of your Zoom screen. So if you do have a question, please pop it in there um, and we'll try and get through as many as we can today. Um, you should be all uh, muted um, and you won't be able to see each other, but you will be able to see us. Um, so yes, if you do have any questions, put them in, in the Q&A. Um, so thank you once again. And I will hand over to Lisa just to introduce what we will be covering today. Good afternoon and thank you, Jonathan. It's lovely that so many people are joining us um, this afternoon. Um, as Jonathan's alluded to, this is a very current topic and it's wonderful that we're able to introduce um, our, our support and the information that we provide within Maggie's, but also that that has a, a sort of an impact within, within the workforce and hopefully we can demonstrate that through, throughout this session. So one of the things I want to cover this afternoon is certainly what the impact is uh, of the menopause. And that's not just on what we notice from a, a physical perspective, but also the psychological and the physiological changes that, that are as a result of our, our lowering hormones as we enter the peri or postmenopausal period. I'm gonna think a little bit about how we can manage those symptoms. And by managing those symptoms, we can optimize our health and well-being, which ultimately leads to a much better quality of life. We're going to think a little bit around the stigma and the common misconceptions that we have. And if those can be altered, again, that has a big impact on how, how we manage and how we live our lives to the best that we can. And as Jonathan's alluded to, towards the end of the session, well, Nicola and I will be having a sort of a panel discussion around 
how those impacts, those changes can manifest to themselves within the workplace and, and what can we do to, to support that. Um, and I think that's going to be really important as we go into the into the future and, and menopause has a, a much bigger place on, on our agenda. So I'll hand over to Nicola now, who's just going to set the scene for menopause within the workplace. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so just to sort of set the scene. So I work for Unum, which is an employee benefits provider. And in March, we introduced a reproductive health policy, which was quite a holistic view, which looks at all of the life events in a, in a women's um, life cycle. So it focuses on fertility, menstruation and menopause. And alongside that, we're offering specialist menopause support from Bupa for our employees as well as remote GP um, service through our Help at Hand service in which employees can select a GP that has menopause training. So we're quite early in our journey, but I think you know, we've made a, a sound start to it this year. And there was a, a recent YouGov poll which found that 72% of organizations don't actually have a policy in place. So it seems as if we're sort of, we're, we're in the minority a bit with that. So alongside a focus on menopause within the workplace, there are a couple of driving factors that I just wanted to briefly touch on. And I think the, the pandemic has really accelerated workplace well-being, so it's moved it up the agenda as well-being has become more sort of central to business delivery and sustainability. And there's really an expectation for well-being to be far more strategically aligned and tailored to the need of a specific employee population and I think as we don't see each other as much in the office there's a greater need to understand our populations through through health data and we certainly found that throughout the pandemic and working from home and working in a hybrid way that those with fluctuating health conditions such as menopause or or perimenopausal symptoms have really been able to manage those symptoms and have a greater sense of control over their environment and, and the way in which they work. Um, and I think as a society um, <clears throat> and, and the impact that we, we've all really experienced through the pandemic, there's also this greater driver for businesses to be really responsible. So taking a responsible business approach and ensuring that they're providing a health supporting culture in which employees can thrive. So those are kind of some of the key sort of drivers that I think are impacting everybody with a, a remit for workplace health. And also sort of set alongside that external landscape, we've just had the second of Davina McCall's uh, documentary. So it's very much sort of, you know, amongst popular debate at the moment. And there's a real drive on social media as well. And this has all enabled us to, to feel more comfortable talking about female health and menopause, to really start to understand it and actually to see that there are role models in society now that we can look upon. And then the data that you can see on the screen in front of you, um, this is really for the financial services sector. There was a really useful piece of research that was done by the Financial Services Skills Commission and the Standard Chartered Bank. So for us as an organisation, this has been particularly useful. And it told us that one in 10 employees are experiencing menopause. That's 128,000 just in, in the sector in which I work alone. And through looking at our own employees, we could see that 13% of our population fall in that 45 to 55 age category. So these are some of the sort of the reasons and the things that we were looking at when we put our policy in place. And we'll touch upon this in a bit more detail, particularly around research in the latter part of the session. So Lisa and I will be having a conversation, we'll be answering Q&As, and we'll be focusing on how we can really help women or actually anyone with a female reproductive system to thrive in the workplace. How the, the menopause and the female health landscape is changing, why it's important to talk and to learn from women going through the menopause, particularly in the workplace, and some of the things that employers can consider doing to support their employees. And I think it's really important to say actually that this topic isn't just for women, it's actually for men just as much as women and it impacts everybody at work. Um, so I think that's that's quite key. So with that point, um, I'm just going to hand back to Lisa. Thank you. 
Lovely. Thank you, Nicola. That's that's really helpful. Um, I'm just going to move on to now um, the opportunity for you all to, um, to, uh, to, to capture this QR code. And if you'd be willing to do that, um, that will take you to a screen where you can just put in a word or three words, up to three words, um, or thoughts around what you feel when you hear the word menopause. Um, and I think that's going to be really helpful. I'll just I'll just give you 30 seconds or so to do that. But that's going to formulate a word cloud, which will just allow us to see what people's thoughts are around the term of menopause. There's a, a lot of different responses there. And, and, and actually, that that in itself is reflective of, of what the menopause means. And, and I think as we go through the next session, we will see that there are so many complexities that feed into the menopause. Um, but I think what's really interesting is, you know, those main themes that are already coming out, the, the brain fog, which, which is huge. And, and in fact, the brain fog, as far as the workplace is concerned, is huge. You know, if suddenly cognitively you're impaired, how, how do you multitask how do you do those three tasks that you normally are able to do when suddenly you don't have that capacity i think hot flush is certainly huge and, and that's something we're certainly going to touch on today old um another really big element that's come out there i think it, it's quite interesting just to share with you perhaps that um i think in our own society we do perceive menopause as being old and end of life and we're we're just we're we're moving past our best years whereas within India um they they see the menopause as something that's actually really spiritual um it's it's someone who is really wise they've they've experienced life and they're held in such a high esteem which is a very very different perspective to what we have here um, in the Western world. So I think, you know, those, those perceptions are really, really important. And hopefully, I'm hoping in, in years to come, those, uh, those perceptions will change. As I'll just pick up on another thing. Um, anxiety, fatigue, uh, um, change. Yes, things are changing. And I think probably in the workplace, we all know change is difficult, it's hard, and we have to implement that in a way that's um, manageable for everybody. Um, does, change is often a very good thing. And so it's how do we put a positive um, spin on that? Um, insomnia. So I think there's lots of issues there that you've all brought forward that actually um, identify with very much of what uh, of what we're we're about um, today so I'm just going to go back to sharing my screen and then I will start to think a little bit about some of those changes that might happen some of the changes that we experience in menopause are very evident um, we know there's the hot flushes the night sweats that's very very um, well associated with that with the change at the perimenopausal or postmenopausal. We may notice that our menstrual cycles change and maybe even stop completely. Fatigue is a huge issue. We know sleep disturbance is something that's very characteristic of those changes in hormone levels. And clearly within the workplace, uh, fatigue, if you've, if you've not slept the night before, then that's gonna have a huge impact on your ability to function as normal um, on a day-to-day -day basis. We also know that um, the changes of hormones can make a big difference to our tissues throughout the whole body, including the vagina. Um, vaginal lining becomes very thin, so we may notice dryness, irritation, possibly discharge, and all of that can lead to painful intercourse. So all of those are very, very interlinked as well as the vagina uh, managing or, or, or experiencing changes. Also our bladder can, can notice changes and that can lead to irritation, um, urinary frequency, urgency, cystitis, maybe getting up more in the evening to pee. So again, 
you know, all of these are inter, interlinked to our quality of life. We know very much that um, a decrease in hormones can affect our mood and how we feel in ourselves. And in fact, many people, peri and postmenopausal, will experience a level of anxiety or depression. It's often reported that weight gain is um, a symptom or, or, or impact of menopause, not just weight gain, but a redistribution of weight and fat cells. So people may not weigh more on the scales, but they may notice that their clothes fit differently or um, their, their, their tissues are just not as toned as they used to be. We've, all, we've mentioned obviously cognitive impairment, that brain fog, um, the poor concentration, very, very classic for, um, for people who um, are peri and postmenopausal. Some of the symptoms that are probably less spoken about or um, experienced in, in the day-to-day -day living with peri and postmenopausal um, periods are weak bones. We know that estrogen is really important in maintaining our bone health and also our heart, our circulatory system. Um, we know that um, going forwards uh, without estrogen has a massive impact on our cardiovascular system. And I'll talk a little bit about that um, as we go through, um, through the session. And headaches and muscle pain. I'm sorry that, that that's not quite aligned, the last muscle and joint pain, but um, there's no difference from that. That's just included in, in that list as, um, as described. So <clears throat> I'm going to initially start thinking about hot flushes. 70% of people who are peri or postmenopausal will experience hot flushes or night sweats. And of those 75%, 50% will find them troublesome. And by finding them troublesome, that means it's actually impacting on their quality of life. So that's something that really we need to be thinking about and addressing. I thought it would be helpful just to think about what a hot flush is, just to think about the physiological changes. So when our core temperature is increased or the external temperatures are increased, our body's response to managing that fluctuation in temperature is to dilate or to make our blood vessels bigger. And what that does is it enables the blood to get closer to the skin surface, enabling the heat from our body to transfer out into the environment, which is why people go red, they, they sweat, they feel really hot. So that's the process by which our body tries to cool its core temperature down. I think what's really important to mention here, and it's something we hear a lot in Maggie's um, with people who come through the door. So we work with a lot of women who are not um, peri or post menopausal ages, but may have had a treatment induced menopause through their cancer treatment. So these are, uh, are women in their 20s, 30s, early 40s. Um, but they will come in and describe a hot flush as something that feels like an anxiety attack. And if you think about the description I've just spoken about where the blood vessels dilate, the heart is now having to pump the blood around the body and there's a much greater area in which it needs to pump the blood. So the heart has to work much, much harder. So clearly the heart rate goes up. It feels like a palpitation and that mimics the response that our bodies have when we're in that fight and flight scenario so it feels like we're having a panic attack but actually this is a physiological response to a hot flush and the raise in 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 core temperature so often understanding that can help people to feel less anxious about um, about what's happening to their bodies when they're having a hot flush I just wanted to talk a little bit about the mechanisms of a hot flush, because again, this can be helpful in, in, in managing that. Um, we all have what is known as a thermoneutral zone. So this is an area, a zone by which our bodies can uh, regulate changes in internal and external temperatures. So, you know, temperature goes up, we, we're fine. Temperature goes down, that's fine. We don't have sweating and we don't have shivering. However, if that thermoneutral zone narrows, which it can do very easily, 
the same differential in temperature change can cause a hot flush, sweating, or conversely, shivering and, and feeling really, really cold to the depth. What I think is really interesting here is we know that when we go through the menopause, the lack of estrogen causes a narrowing of that thermoneutral zone. But what's also important to remember is that external factors such as stress, fear, worry, anxiety, caffeine, alcohol, foodstuffs can also narrow that um, thermoneutral zone further. And I think that's important to understand when we think about how we can perhaps manage those hot flushes going forwards, because clearly we potentially is maybe not a lot we can do about the estrogen unless we're taking HRT, but there are clearly other factors that we can be focusing on um, if these external factors are impacting on that reduction of the thermoneutral zone also. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as, as we go through, but I think sometimes it's just helpful to, to visualize what's actually happening um, with, within our, our systems in response to these um, triggers. So thinking about what can we do pharmacologically, what can we do from taking a tablet and making everything better? So the strap line at the moment is that HRT is very definitely the way to go. Um, I think historically there's been concern and worry about um, the safety of HRT, but the current recommendation by NICE, which is the sort of the governing um, regulations over uh, management of medical issues, and by the British Menopause Society is that if you're under the age of 60 with no underlying healthcare um, issues, then HRT potentially offers a benefit um, and there are no safety issues around that. And there are several ways in which we can take um, HRT, clearly orally uh, through a tablet, transdermal, so that's either through a patch or gel that's rubbed onto the upper arm or thighs. Um, vaginal estrogen can be used and that's a really useful tool if for any reason you can't take estrogen either transdermally or orally so potentially if you have a breast cancer um, then then vaginal estrogen can be used to minimize those vaginal changes that I spoke about a little bit earlier and they can also be applied into uterine so um, pretty much like a coil so they're absorbed through through the uterus so there are an array of non-HRT or, or sort of non-hormonal therapy treatments. So if for any reason you have uh, contraindications to taking estrogen, then antidepressants, anticonvulsants and antispasmodics have all been shown to lower the, the impact of uh, hot flushes and the number of hot flushes. These do cause side effects or potentially cause side effects. And so there's a real discussion there to have with your healthcare professional about risk and benefits. If your hot flushes, night sweats are causing a huge impact on your quality of life, minimal side effects from those um, medications may be a small risk to take um, to improve your overall quality of life. And those are discussions we have with our, our cancer patients on a daily basis. Um, right, so you may, may, may or may not have heard there are lots of non-pharmacological interventions, so not taking medications. There's a recent um, study that's come out that cognitive behavioural therapy is really impactful on reducing hot flushes and perception of hot flushes um, to the point where NICE are now recommending it as something that any woman presenting to their primary care team should be offered CBT. There was a, a study done in the British Medical Journal a little while ago that showed auricular acupuncture. So acupuncture to the ear is really helpful um, in, again, reducing intensity and number of hot flushes and night sweats and also clinical hypnotherapy. So those are interventions that people can use. And if we think back to that slide around the thermoneutral zone, what we're doing with all of those interventions is reducing anxiety and giving the individual some control 
over the emotions that are associated with a hot flush. I'm now just going to come on to the alternatives and um, there is a word of caution around the alternatives. Clearly, St. John's wort, photoestrogens, black cow horse, they've all been shown to potentially have an impact, a positive impact on hot flushes. Slight caution, they are not regulated. We do not, not know what's in those um, preparations. And certainly if you're on any other medication, particularly a cancer medication, we know that they interrupt the absorption of some of those um, those preparations. We also know that a lot of them cause liver toxicity. So if there's any liver compromisation before you go onto them, I would probably um, avoid if you can. So, sorry, my slides have been very slow moving on. There we go. Um, just a few lifestyle thoughts. Um, I've alluded to the fact that stimulants can increase um, our hot flushes and reduce that, that zone. So coffee, alcohol, spicy foods, and just that rushing around that busyness. And it might be worth if people are feeling um, that they've had a particularly bad period of, of hot flushes, just to reflect on, you know, what have they done in that day? What have they eaten? What have, have they had to drink? So it just allows um, more information about what's potentially triggering their hot flushes. Fairly <clears throat> obvious stuff here, wearing light layers is helpful and, and lots of layers. So when you get that real hot flush, you can take all the layers off, but then if you get really cold, you can put them all back on again. Loose fitting clothes. Cotton is very definitely the best um, fabric to have next to the skin um, during hot flushes. Many of our patients say they found sleeping on a towel is really helpful. So if they have that horrendous night sweat, they're not having to get up and change the sheets. They can just have um, a couple of, uh, of towels next to them that they can just swap over. So it's disturbing their sleep less. And you may or may not have heard about the chillo pillow, but we know the center that regulates our core temperature is is the hypothalamus, which sits in the base of the brain or sort of at the base of the skull. Um, so having a pillow where people can put some cooling area around the sensitive um, hypothalamus can actually regulate the body temperature a little bit more effectively. So they're relatively cheap on Amazon, but something that might be really helpful to um, just minimize in those nighttime sweats. So moving on to low mood and depression, we know 20% of people peri and postmenopausal will have some degree of mood change um, and possibly uh, diagnosable um, impact of uh, depression or um, anxiety. This is all to do with the neurotransmitters. So these are the little um, transmitters in the brain which are, are triggered when we are exposed to stress or to lower estrogen, hence why the antidepressants work for hot flushes. Um, and so that's, that's something that we, we can just be aware of if we're entering the peri or postmenopausal period and our mood is lower, you know, we're looking for reasons. Maybe it is just as a result of our lowered um, hormone levels. I think it's important to remember that if you've had a premenopausal diagnosis of depression, say um, a postnatal depression diagnosis, you are much more likely. And I think that 20% figure goes closer to 50%. So again, being proactive and, and recognizing that that's something that may well be um, an issue going forwards. So I'm just gonna give you a, a couple of bullet points that I think are really worth um, remembering, things that you can do for yourself to really optimize your health and well-being during this time or sharing with your, your, your colleagues. Um, I've mentioned the bone thinning, really important. We don't notice that until we fall and break a bone. Um, but the rate of which our good cells, our bone cells fall off is, is guided by the amount of estrogen we have. So when the estrogen falls, we don't replace those cells as quickly as we would do normally. The things that you can do that are really, really effective in maintaining our bone health is exercise. 
it has to be weight bearing. So putting stress through the bones. So that could be power walking, it could be running, going to the gym, anything where you're getting um, agitation of the bone cells will increase that bone strength. Um, so I think that's certainly something that we can all be very mindful of. In the UK, the only vitamin supplement that is recommended for us all to be taking during the winter months is vitamin D. And every single one of us should be doing that through the winter. For us that are peri and postmenopausal, we should be taking it every single day through summer and winter. Um, and that can be taken as a tablet or as a spray. But in order for the vitamin D to be effective, we also need to be taking calcium. Ordinarily, um, premenopausal, we should be taking five portions of calcium a day. Peri and post, we should be taking seven portions. Um, and a portion is a sort of a matchbox size of cheese, a small pot of yogurt, 200 mils of milk. Um, it's also found in leafy vegetables, nuts and dried fruits. Um, I've got a really lovely sheet actually that's um, produced by the British Dietetic Association, which um, just shows you how much um, calcium is in each of our foodstuffs and how much we need to eat. So I'll get Jonathan to send that around after the session so that you can all have that as a, as a reference. And then heart health, um, our estrogen promotes the absorption of good cholesterol and inhibits the absorption of bad cholesterol. That's all altered um, clearly when we don't have the estrogen. So I think just thinking about uh, heart health, go towards 10 portions of fresh fruit and vegetables a day. That's a lot, but every little bit helps. Reducing salt in intake can be really important. We know that increases blood pressure. So in a situation where potentially we're having fatty plaques build up in the arteries, that just brings that down a little bit more. And again, I sort of bang on again, that exercise, that's, that's crucial. Um, so, Sorry, this is very slow at changing my slides. There we go. A couple of take home messages. Just people are not alone with this. 13 million of us are, are in, in this situation at the moment. Um, I think what's really alarming, many of these women are going to their GP and it's not recognized as being menopause or they're certainly not offered HRT. So having the conversation and being empowered to have that conversation is really important. Um, and I think it's quite interesting that Nicola said earlier that 72% of um, workplaces didn't have a policy. My figures say 72% of women don't feel supported within the workplace. So I think that's quite reflective. But what that means is 10% of our workforce who are, you know, very, very experienced in, the, in their careers potentially look at giving up or, or altering their work patterns. So I think we need to keep talking. Um, certainly the education and communication is really, really important. And, and ultimately, you know, this is a journey and hopefully with that communication, we can experience it in, in a, a more positive way rather than seeing it as a problem. I wanted to move on to kind of this panel discussion and I have a few different questions that we can touch on. Um, if you do have a question, please put it in the Q&A. Um, but I wanted to start off with uh, maybe uh, directed to you, Nicola, what is important for businesses to consider when developing policies around menopause and how can workplaces kind of be more open to having these discussions internally? Sure, thank you. Um, so I think in terms of sort of approaching a policy, there's lots and lots of templates out there for a starter for the you know for the majority that don't have a policy in place and I think the starting point is really to actually talk to women in the organization and, and find out what their real life experience is um, and then I think the other thing is is really around sort of getting very close to what that experience is and then working out where the gaps are in the system. So whether it be support, whether it be education, whether it be providing employee to employee kind of support networks and really sort of mapping out from the ground upwards. Um, and certainly that's sort of the approach we've taken. And then um, what's also been really key for us, which might be useful for others, is kind of thinking about the responsibilities that sit within that piece as well. So 
what is the responsibility of the employee? So as Lisa was just talking about the different elements that are within the control of women to look after their nutrition, their physical activity, et cetera. We've gone as far as to say, you know, these are the responsibilities of an employee and here are the resources, the access points in which you, you can gain access to those. But then what are the responsibilities of the line manager? What are the responsibilities of the workplace? And actually really just sort of laying that out in a very sort of practical way um, would kind of be my start of a 10 on that one. Thank you so much um, for that. It's great that a lot of workplaces are kind of create, thinking about this even, whereas before they wouldn't have. Um, and it's great to kind of, you know, hear about the work that you're doing at Unum and also looking in the news at other businesses who are, who are also doing this. Yeah, um, absolutely. Great. Um, and going on to kind of some of the stigma or myths around menopause, how can these maybe affect women in the workplace? Um, how kind of do some of these myths around menopause, uh, what are they uh, for, for a starter and, and how do they lead to discrimination? Well, I think, you know, as Lisa was saying, that, that sort of difference between um, the culture in India to sort of the Western culture where we very much associate menopause um, negatively, it's aging, you know, you're old, you're not being productive, you can no longer do your job. There's all of these negative connotations. And I think um, the research that I had on my um, opening slide was showing that only 22% of women, and this was in was within financial service sector, but only 22% of them um, actually disclosed the fact that they were going through menopause. So I think there's this real veil of, of silence on this topic in the workplace. You know, we're in really early days, we're only just starting to talk about this, and there's a real unease and, and discomfort actually. Um, about talking about it. I'm having some real kind of tentative conversations, even with my colleagues sort of off the back of launching our, our reproductive health policy. And we've had some education sessions and people kind of feeling quite uncomfortable about some of the, the discussions and the topics that we've been covering around female health. So I think there really is a lot of stigma um, and discomfort around the subject at the moment. But if I think back to where we were with mental health, we were in a very similar position you know and we've advanced so much for that topic and I'm sure we will for menopause um, you know and it's the same when I talk to my US colleagues they're not even touching the menopause topic at the moment so you know it's it's still early days I think in, in terms of that one. Definitely um, I've seen in the Q&A box actually um, we've had lots of um, different questions around HRT. Um, some of them are kind of, what about many of us who've had estrogen positive breast cancer, or we have a family history of blood clots, what else is available? <clears throat> um, maybe Lisa, could you just kind of speak to that? We've also had um, a comment around the, um, the recommendation um, that healthy women under the age of 60 shouldn't be concerned about the safety profile of HRT and it references something in the Davina McCall program about kind of how important it seems to be able to get hormonal treatment um, earlier. Could you kind of just follow up on kind of those questions around HRT? Absolutely. So firstly, just thinking about um, if you're unable to take estrogen and actually that's my my day job. So majority of, of the girls um, I'm working with are unable to take estrogen because they, they have an estrogen sensitive tumor. Um, and that's often overlooked, um, you know, in, in the midst of, of everything that's going on with, with cancer treatment and survival. Um, so all of the things that I listed that are alternative to the pharmacological intervention, so the CBT, acupuncture, clinical hypnotherapy can be helpful with the hot flushes and the symptoms. Um, the bone health is, is, is really important, as is the heart health. Um, and there are things that you can do um, to optimize your well being within that setting. But also, um, you know, you should be having DEXA scans to check your bone. It, bones are healthy if, if, if you've had a, an early menopause, um, particularly. Um, and I think Maggie's across the whole of the UK, so we, we are situated, um, as, as Jonathan said earlier, we're across the whole of the UK and even 
all of my menopause workshops are done virtually. So if if anybody wants to contact us for specific information, then I'm very happy to do that. Um, but there certainly should be things in place to make sure that you are optimizing your health and well-being in a scenario if you can't take HRT. Um, so going back to the fact that um, I, I think the, the time at which we're offered HRT is really important. There is now an edict that um, if any woman over the age of 45 presents to their GP with low mood, um, any sort of um, change in the, the vasomotor symptoms, so the, the hot flushes, they should be able to access HRT without a blood test. Um, and I think my feeling is, as we go forwards, that will become policy, that that will just be routine, that women from the age of 45 will be offered to HRT almost without symptoms. I think there's a lot more to be done around research and studies of the impact of that on our well-being and our long-term overall health. Um, but I think the biggest focus for us at the moment is it's not contraindicatory to um, negative outcomes to take HRT from an early age. Um, the Div Davina McCall, I think it's brilliant that it's raised all those issues. And I was really pleased to see in the second episode that it did mention that HRT isn't the only option because there are so many of us out there that perhaps cannot take HRT because of all of the reasons people have mentioned the blood clots um, or, or an estrogen sensitive um, tumour. Thank you. It's great. It's great that there is a lot of advice out there. Um, and it's great that you can kind of touch on that and, and that we have kind of these sorts of spaces to ask questions and to talk amongst ourselves. And I, I will definitely share Lisa's email address um, when I kind of send out the recording of this and when I send out the slides as well. So thank you all for asking questions. There's a lot coming in on kind of um, different symptoms. So kind of um, alleviating brain fog um, and also kind of the difference um, across cultures, Nicola was saying kind of the attitudes towards menopause in the US might be kind of not where we are in the UK. There's um, someone who's kind of just mentioned that um, doctors in the US has, um, has not prescribed HRT, but whereas in the UK, a lot of their friends are benefiting from HRT. What are the, um, what does, I want to kind of touch more on kind of this shifting landscape around menopause in the workplace. Um, you mentioned some, there was some research that we showed at the beginning. Um, is there anything else that you can tell us about kind of um, the shifting landscape on the conversation around menopause? What, what's the culture been like at UNAM? Have people been receptive to it? Are people kind of opening up a bit more? Um, there's a, po a policy there, but I guess kind of how, how are people reacting to it? And, and I guess you, you have worked at different places. Do you know if there's been a different there, a difference there? Yeah, it's been interesting actually, um, because when we were sort of looking at this initially, we were kind of costing out because um, we were sort of looking at the service provision that we had in place in terms of support for employees and looking to identify the gaps. And um, obviously we've brought in some additional services. I mentioned sort of the Bupa menopause plan, for example, and obviously there's a cost implication with that. So we had to sort of project our costs, you know, worst case scenario, everybody in the band between 45 to 55. So 13% of our population takes it up, you know, highly unlikely, but what would that look like? But actually the reality is it's been a really slow burn this one. So um, in terms of sort of the support that we're putting in place, um, we've only had a handful of employees actually take it up at this point. So we weren't sure if we would get sort of a spike of interest that would peter off. But what we're actually seeing is it's just a really sort of slow kind of steady burn. People are accessing those the service as and when they need it. And often um, people will contact me as the, the wellbeing consultant and often they have seen their GP. Um, they may or may not be taking HRT, but actually they just want another opinion because they're still having some symptoms or they're not quite sure. And actually there's some level of anxiety or uncertainty around 
around sort of what the medication or the, the route that they're taking. So um, we've been able to kind of provide that reassurance through, through the service of um, support that we're providing. So in terms of kind of culture, it's very much a, a slow burn. There's not been a huge amount of noise about it. Um, at this stage, but I think it's been very well received. And I think because um, we didn't take the approach of just purely focusing on menopause, because I think if to take that approach, you kind of think, well, why are you just focusing on menopause? What about all the other sort of life events um, for women? So I think the fact that we've taken a holistic approach we've included fertility, menstruation and menopause, means that there's something for everyone almost and actually it's been very well received um, by employees but certainly there hasn't been this sort of um, huge kind of reaction that we anticipated there might be. I think for us in terms of next step and sort of to that cultural point um, what we do want to do going forward is really more education so we've we've held some sessions for employees around symptoms very similar to the stuff that Lisa's just covered off actually around symptoms for lots of different life events for women um, but I think we want to do a bit more about how you know the fact that these symptoms are very transient which is one of the myths that people think if you have menopause or symptoms you always have them and actually they're quite sort of transient um, you know, and I think we want to do some more around how you can actually use that information to optimize your performance, to get the best out of your day and to plan the type of activity you're doing in association with how you're feeling at that given point in time. So I think we want to kind of use that education to sort of push this forward a little bit um, throughout the organization. So it's not necessarily seen as the negative that it might be. Thank you. Um, you, you spoke earlier about kind of line managers and how they can support. What do you think kind of line managers and I guess kind of leadership at organizations do to support um, women going through the menopause or actually kind of facilitating kind of an open culture at work where people kind of yeah. don't feel they need to hide or kind of blame themselves for what they're going through? Absolutely. I think we need senior female role models to actually, as we have done at Unum, we've done it for mental health, actually, we've had senior leaders sort of say, actually, I've struggled with my mental health. And, you know, this was my experience. This is how I've overcome it. I think we're hoping to move to that place where we actually do that for our female senior leaders. And certainly harking back to the research that was done. Um, really, it's your senior leaders that are most impacted by the menopause, because by the time somebody's got to, you know, a natural menopause between 45 to 55, they're usually quite advanced in their career. You know, they've got years of experience and skills and talent that they've they've honed over the over the years and unfortunately they're the people that are leaving you know they're um, less likely to um, go for promotion and um, actually I've got the data here half of them said that they were less likely to go for a promotion and a quarter said that they're more likely to leave ahead of retirement and so you know, you're using you're losing that huge kind of talent um, so to have female senior leaders who are role models for that group of employees is is huge and I think that's kind of the area that, that we're wanting to focus on going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's so um that's uh, shocking statistics as well. Mm -hmm. I know we've spoken okay. about it previously and it just shows that the need for kind of um senior female role models to kind of speak about this. Um, I know we have a lot of questions kind of about kind of the more medical side which Lisa's picked up with. Uh, would you like to kind of address a, a few of the questions in the chat at the moment? I think they're kind of around primary care knowledge and um, prescriptions. Yeah, I, I think, I, and I, I noticed in the chat there were a few people that had mentioned um, how difficult it was to access HRT or to have those conversations with their GP. And I think I alluded to that a little bit in the presentation that, you know, even for my um, cancer cohort that I work with, um, it, it's something that's not really recognised. Um, I work very closely with two GPs who are both trained in menopause and sexology and Together, we're really trying to raise the profile uh, amongst um, primary care. We, we're going to present at a, a conference 
uh, we've got two conferences actually that we're presenting at in June and July. Um, but I think I can only encourage you if you've had a conversation with your GP and it hasn't been successful or you don't feel you've been heard. Um, again, I'm very happy for you to contact me. I can give you the evidence base. I can send um, uh, patient information that's uh, uh, available for you that you are able to take to your GP. But I think um, often menopause um, training is not part of the medical training. Um, so I think we're in a situation where we have our GPs out in the community and often I think us as service users potentially are less or, or are more educated than possibly the GPs we're sitting in front of. So it's, it's about having that equal partnership in, in the conversation around what might be helpful for you. Um, and I, there are menopause specialists around. And again, uh, the British Menopause Society have a list that you can all access of who's local within your area. Um, but again, I'm very happy to support you with, with that if, if there are questions ongoing from, from that issue. Thank you. Um, that's really good to hear about the list. Is that a menopause specialist who are available on the NHS? No, unfortunately, the NHS don't support menopause. Um, uh, so most of them tend to be private. Um, so yeah, it, it is very difficult to get that, that information. However, most of those that are set up in private practice are doing it because they realize there is no NHS um, accessibility and um, offer it at a, a really good um, a re reduction of price. And also it, it's that one-off session where you're just having a consultation to know how best to proceed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, there, there's kind of a, a few other questions around some, some other symptoms. So kind of dry mouth, burning tongue, um, aches and pains, brain fog as well. Um, during the course of the presentation, we kind of touched on some ways that we can manage hot flushes and um, briefly kind of, kind of bone health and heart health. Um, do you have any good resources that we can include around kind of dry mouth and um, aches and pains and brain fog as well? Um, that we can direct people to. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll pull all of those and I'll, I'll get them over to you, Jonathan, so you can send them out um, with the slides. Thank you. Yes, because um, we are kind of um, coming gently towards the, the end of our presentation. So um, I would really love to kind of um, answer everyone's question directly. But I, I think it's if it's about kind of specific things, then we will definitely compile some resources and send it out in, in the packet. Um, we have, we've had, um, another kind of anonymous, um, comment saying brain fog and loss of vocabulary are hundred percent a barrier to career and being terminated. So where I can cope in my current role to learn a new role in a new company is an impossibility. I feel like my next career move will be working in a grocery store. This is not intending to be disparaging, just reality of what I feel I could command. So I think kind of, yeah, it's these symptoms and or the management of these symptoms can definitely kind of be a barrier to people kind of progressing in, in their careers. Do you have any kind of advice or thoughts or yes, on, on kind of that? Um, I, uh, Nicola, I don't know whether that actually that might be helpful for you to, uh, in the workplace to be able to, to just think about how someone might approach their employers um, yeah. and, and Thought, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that makes me really sad, actually, hearing hearing that comment. Um, and I think I would I would urge anyone who feels like that to actually speak to their current in, employer and, um, you know, really encourage you not to have that sort of all or nothing thinking, because often there are things that you can do practical things. I mean, I get brain fog and I have notes all around me for today that, you know, should should that happen, I've got stuff, you know, I've, I know that I've got my, my way around it. And I, I mean, we all do that for lots of different things. It doesn't need to be something that's um, in connection with the menopause. So I think, um, I think sort of taking a, a solution focused approach to maybe well, what are the sticking points, the things that 
that are really causing a problem, what might some of those workarounds be? And I think exploring that, you know, with current employer, whether it be a line manager or another manager or HR or someone that's trusted in the organisation is a really good kind of starting point, because I think um, when people are having these symptoms, um, it's sometimes it's hard to get a sense of perspective because you know how much they're they're impacting you and actually it might not be apparent to others around you um, or it might not be perceived to be the issue that you perceive it to be so I think start talking about it and just start that conversation would actually be my um my sort of advice on that one actually and and trying not to have that that all or nothing thinking on it but trying to take a bit more of a solution focused tack. Thank you so much. Um, there's a lot of questions coming in, even though we have um, kind of a couple minutes ago, would love to kind of get through them. Um, there's one on training resources and modules. I work in a male dominated business and want the education to hit the right note. Maybe that's something we can explore and include, um, especially I know there are partners here from construction and and other um, industries that might have uh, more men working in them. So, and and can I just say one very quick word on that? Um, just to make all employers and and colleagues aware that if you have a gentleman in your workforce who has prostate cancer, he's likely to be on hormone um, manipulation, which will put him into a menopause, exactly the same as what we're experiencing as women. Um, and that's uh, something I'm really trying to raise awareness about and address within Maggie's. But again, in the workplace, you know, if you have someone that comes in with a prostate cancer diagnosis, just be mindful that all of the above that we've spoken about will be applicable to him. That's really great. Great to know. Interesting as well. Um, thank you all so much for coming today. Um, I think it's been such a great session and we've had such a brilliant turnout for this. Um, I want to um, remind you that there's a short feedback survey that will pop up once the webinar ends. It'd be great if you could um, respond to that. Before we close, um, I'd like to ask what's one thing that you'll take away that inspired you? Lots of feedback understanding, hope, education, knowledge, not alone, alternative treatments, reassuring. Um, I'm glad it's been reassuring for you. Um, and as you can see by the 100 people that joined us today, it is such a topic that people want to learn more about, want to support people about. Um, and I think kind of thank you to Lisa um, for providing such a wealth of knowledge um, and thank you to Nicola as well uh, for leading this at Unum um, and for speaking about um, the work you're doing um, in the workplace. Um, and it's great that kind of slowly but surely um, the landscape is changing um, in kind of the public sphere and also in the workplace as well, um, evident kind of by the, the work you're doing at Unum with your policies um, and with your internal conversations as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we will um, be ending the webinar. Um, but yes, if you would like to get in touch with any of us, um, then we will provide kind of our contact details on the packet that we'll share. Um, and thank you once again.